In Psalm 11, such a great psalm, powerful psalm, it talks about, again, David. And sometimes the background becomes so powerful, and sometimes that becomes really the whole message of the message it has. And tonight, it's one of those great, great messages that we realize that David, David had three incredible times in his life. He had one, we call it the country, where he actually was raising the flock and where he learned to worship. And that's where David learned to really just pour his heart out to God. He was by himself. He was young. He was innocent. You see the difference? He was innocent. And because of that, he was very tender before God. And God got a hold of him in those tender years of his life. And that's why I bring reference to this man this morning, because it really is a tremendous miracle for some of us getting saved after 50. It's just hard to believe because we get set in our ways. And so when someone gets saved after 50, you just realize, God, what are you doing? It's the young kids. Are usually 80% of them are usually teenagers that get saved. But as you get older in life, you get kind of set in your ways and you kind of make a decision. But when God begins to break your heart and God begins to get in there, you know, you just can't stop. I remember one service we had the mayor of Hawthorne just run up here and ask Jesus into his heart. And that doesn't make a difference, but God spoke to his heart. And it's just something that you don't think people do, but they do when God gets a hold of them. But he was tender. And we lose that tenderness through life, usually through trials or through marriage or through difficult times or through business. We get hurt, we get offended, and we kind of get hardened. And so David didn't do that. David was tender, and he fought a lion, and he fought a bear, you remember. And uh, he was able to see God's power. And not only that, but in those years, he was able to sit under the stars. He was able just to enjoy life because dad didn't need him. The brothers were growing. They were out to war. And David really had kind of three jobs. He had the tending of the flock. He had really the tending of his brothers. And then he had the tending of going, doing things for his dad, for his brothers. And it was at the time of him taking food to his brothers that he came across Goliath. The second time we meet David is really there in the court where now he's with Saul. And Saul was, you remember, demon-possessed. And the spirit came over him because he would not give up the kingdom. It was Samuel that said, you know, I'm going to take the kingdom out of your hands. And Saul just grabbed him and said, no. And he ripped the garment of Samuel. And Samuel was blind. And Samuel said, as you have ripped my garment, so God has ripped the kingdom out of your hands. But Saul would not give it up. And it's interesting, in all the years of Saul, he never worshipped. And yet he did things that were not pleasing to God. He sacrificed, would not wait. And so it was during those times that David was hired to come in and play for Saul and drive away the evil spirit with his songs. So David would be worshipping in the courts. It was also in that time that David grew up in wisdom. So I could say that the younger years, the tender years, him out in the country, it was a time of worship. In the times of court, I would say it was a time of wisdom. He understood what was going on. He understood the politics. He understood the king was possessed. And he also understood the rages of time. And so there are times that Saul was so wild that he would throw a, a spear at David, and David ducked. He also saw through spears at his own son, Jonathan. And it was during that time that David and Jonathan worked out this thing where if his dad was okay to come in to see him, then, of course, Saul, Jonathan would let him know. And so those were years of kind of just wisdom, how to live, what to do, and they were not a whole lot, not, not a long time. But then there was the last part of his life, and that was really that area of the cave. And that is where God really drove David to his knees. And those are the times that we find in David's life that he had to run for his life. He had to absolutely get going. There are times that Saul almost got him. There are times that Saul came into the cave when David was in the cave. And for years and years and years and years and years, David had to run for his life. We believe that the psalm here was written right after David got married to uh, Saul's daughter. You remember Saul made a commitment, whoever can kill Goliath can have my daughter. It was in that marriage that 
David went ahead and took her. But it was a horrible marriage. She didn't like to worship. In fact, when David danced before the Lord, you remember, in his garment, it was her that she mocked him. And that was the last time David had a relationship with her. It was a time where people came against David. And all of a sudden, you remember the women cried out, David slew 10,000, Saul slew 1,000. And the Bible says from that moment, it was Saul that eyed David. And so things became very heated for David. And finally, David had to leave and run for his life. And so the psalm is written during that time of David running for his life and really people coming after David. It talks about the poisonous arrows, and it talks about people rising up and people doing things to David and people misunderstanding. It was during that time, you remember, the priests were killed. Some 85 high priests were killed because, uh, once again, Saul got bad information. And boy, David received food, and he received the, the, taberna- uh, the, the bread off the show table. And, and because of that, Saul killed those priests. He didn't care. And so David had to carry that on his own heart. And so as we get into this psalm, the first thing you're going to notice right off the bat is the incredible trust David had, the tender trust that David had a choice. And the choice was either to run and hide or to trust God with all of his heart. And sometimes we just would rather run and not face issues. But we have to come to a point in our life that we're going to learn to trust God. And when I come to that point, then I usually just settle down and I begin to partake of the Lord. And that means I learn to eat in the presence of my enemies. In Psalm 23, that's what it says, in the presence of his enemies. So it means that I open my Bible when things are falling apart. It means I can come to a point where I can see God working in my life. And no longer am I getting out of God's word and just going crazy. It means I'm being driven to the Lord. And that's what David said, drive me to that rock. That rock is higher than I. And he even came to a point that says, I'm lost. God, show me that rock. Take me to that rock. Because he had lost his way. And that was the greatness of David. He was not afraid to say to God, I'm lost. He was not afraid to say to God he was backslidden. And he was not afraid to acknowledge his sins before God. But his confidence in God and his trust in God is what we're going to take a look at tonight. So in that cave, as he's hiding from Saul, this is probably written. Also, he walks away from his marriage because it's just a horrible political marriage, and he's just a mess. David has no friends, no situation. He doesn't even have his army as yet. And we come to chapter 11, and we realize that David begins to rejoice just in the providence of God. And sometimes that's all you have. Habakkuk had to learn the same. Habakkuk, you remember there in the book of Habakkuk, that it says that he began to spin around and jump and rejoice, though there was no food in the barns, no food at all in any area of his life. In other words, the barns were empty, the fields were empty, everything inside was empty. There was nothing left because the locusts had destroyed it. And yet he spins around and begins to rejoice. How? In the sovereignty of God, in the providence of God. And you can do it if you have that type of faith. And so, you know, it's like the faith that says, okay, I'm going to jump and spin around when I'm broke. Not when I get the check, but before I get the check. It's like I don't know where the money's coming from, but I'm going to rejoice and praise God because I know it's coming. That's the faith I'm talking about. Now, if you get the check and it's $10,000, I'll join you and jump around and spin around with you. But that's really not faith. That's just joy, unspeakable, full of goodness. But it's when you can jump and spin around and your wife says, what are you doing? I'm just rejoicing. Why? Because I believe God's bringing it. Are you crazy? (laughs) That's when really faith is really real because you believe in the providence of God. And so he says in verse 1, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? So in the Lord put I my trust. So it is a decision he's made. It's a consciousness he's made a decision to live in the presence of God with no friends, no phone, no cell phone, no iPad. He can get through the night. He can go to sleep without that stuff. He can put his head on a cold rock and get a good night's sleep because it's him and God. You say, well, how can he do that? You remember I said that he was a sweet psalmist? That's why. The same with David. David or Daniel, I should say, Daniel was able to go inside with the lions and have a good night's sleep. How could he do that? Because he knew that he said to the king, 
O King, live forever. The God whom I serve continually, he has sent his angels to watch over their mouth. And so God shut their mouth. Now just to show you how hungry those lions were in the Bible, the Holy Spirit makes sure that when they threw the people in, the Bible says they broke their bones before they even hit the ground. That's how hungry they were. Just to kind of help you, because some people say, well, you know, the lions weren't hungry, so it's no big thing. Well, I'll tell you what, there's another killing at one of the lion areas this, recent, this week. It was a woman, I believe, that she was mauled to death. And don't know all the details, but she was killed because the lions turned. And the Bible does say in the last days, animals are going to turn on us. Why? Because they're grieved. They are waiting for that day of redemption, and they're going to turn. So here, in the Lord put I my trust. So what do I do? David did that. He looked to God. How say ye to my soul? And the reason why is notice this in verse 3. Because your foundations are are destroyed. The, the foundations are destroyed. But then here's the reason why in verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. So God, you are setting in the heavens. That's why I can trust God. See, in verse 4, God is in the heavens. And then secondly, in verse 4, it says very simply, because your eyes see everything. So God knows exactly what's going on. The Bible says all things are naked and open before him and whom we have to deal with in Hebrews you know, 4.13. In 4.12, that's the scripture we all know, that it's, it's the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So it's able to cut and do all these things. And then verse 13 says, everything is naked and open before God. So when you see that, you begin to think, oh, God, I don't like that. Just go away. Well, if you want God out of your life, that'd be terrible. I'd rather have God knowing everything than God out of my life. So God sees everything. He even sees the enemy. He laughs at them. They're dropping a bucket. And the third reason that David's able to trust God is because in verse 5, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked he's going to judge. So he's going to send judgment. So it's three things kind of cool in verse 4 and 5. Number one, the Lord sets in heaven. Number two, the Lord sees from heaven. And number three, the Lord sends judgment from heaven. So you have to understand that God is always going to watch over you and God's going to protect you. And you can pray this prayer, God, deliver me. Or you can say, God, reward them according to their works. So if people are hurting you, David prayed that prayer. God, you reward them for what they're doing to me. That's a terrible thing to say, you know. And God, they're cursing at me. They're trying to get me fired. They're trying to step on my toes. God, just bless them. Reward them for their works. That's a terrible thing to say. Or you can say this prayer, which is even better. God, deliver me from unreasonable people. You have someone that drives you crazy at work? Well, God, deliver me from unreasonable people. God will do that. He'll make a way. You have not. Why? Because you ask not. So you can pray that prayer. If it doesn't happen, then guess what? God brought that person to you. <laughs> he got, which way do you want to look at it? You're kidding me. You mean George is here again? George is with you for the rest of your life. You know, that's just somebody who's going to be bugging you and trying to work in your personality and work in your temperament. And that personality and temperament just drives you crazy. Well, God gives you that person to help you. And when you finally master it, then you probably will get married or something like that. But you just got to be careful. God is working in your heart. And you just can't. You can run from church to church. They're there. You can go from this to this. It's there. And so he says, in the Lord put I my trust. Now, when I personally have the ability, listen, to set and see the power of God and to know that God sees. Now, what did he say once again to Moses? God said, I have seen my people. I've seen the affliction. I've heard their cry, and I know the reason of taskmasters. And uh, I think it's Exodus 3. I've seen my people. I've heard their cry. I know what they're going through. Okay, so God sees and God hears, and God knows. Does that help me? Not at all. The next verse says in Exodus, and I have come to deliver them. That's the key. So if all I ever say is, God, you can see, and God, you can hear, and God, you know, that doesn't help me. I need the one more step. And Steve, I've come to help you. So you call on the name of God, and I will come and help you. You call with all your heart, and I will help you in the time of your affliction, and you will glorify me. And that's always how it works. 
God, help me. Steve, I'm here. God, I love you. And that's the way it should be. So never get to a point in your life that you doubt the providence of God. Never say to yourself, this has to be done before I really give God the place in my heart. Never say, I can't really rejoice until you change or that person changes. That's not true. You can rejoice in the marriage you have, and you can be joyful in the situation even though he has not changed or she has not changed because you're going to rejoice in the Lord, and you know that God hears your cry, and God's going to work in each of your life in time being. Now, he might work in your life quicker than his, but by you helping God, guess what? That is going to really prolong the situation. And the same thing happens when you open the oven and shut it, trying to make those cookies. You're going to take a 15-minute thing and turn it into a 45-minute thing because you're helping God out. He doesn't need your help. So when you put, you know, tracks in the toilet paper and tracks in his bologna sandwich, it doesn't really help. It drives him crazy. It'd be better for you to have that meek and quiet spirit and shine with real victory in your heart because he will not be able to put up with that. The same thing with guys. It'd be better for you to walk in the presence of God and let your wife see it and turn her life over to Christ. We try to say, well, I did this, so therefore do that. Or we try to say, God, I'm going to give you money. I'm going to tithe, okay? So where's that 100%? Well, God might see that you are greedy and needy and you want it now. And so God might just say, you know, the Bible says in this life and the life to come. So I think I'll give it to you in the life to come. Oh, I thought now. Well, if that's what you live for, no. If you don't live for that, then okay. So God can give you five extra dollars, and it can stumble you big time. It might be just enough to go out and buy that beer. But if you can handle the 50000 then so be it. If you can understand what it is to give and keep giving, and even if God does not give back to you, it doesn't make a difference because you're not giving to God threatening God and boasting and telling God, I'm waiting for you to bless. But you just believe. It might come back seven, no eight ways. So I gave here, so it's going to come back through the church. No, it might come back through a relative. So now why are you telling God how he should bless you and how it should come? You see, I thought you gave it by faith, and when you gave it, you laughed and said bye-bye, never to see it again. You see, you gave it with a cheerful heart. You gave it with no strings attached. Amen? Oh, maybe not. See, maybe you're trying to buy God, or maybe you're fasting because you want to challenge God. God, I fasted, now take care of my family. Or God, I want you to change my husband. Why? Because he's mean. Is that the only reason you want him to change? How about God change him so he goes to heaven? You see, what happens if you say, God, you know, how about give me the strength, and God, he might not change for another year, but my goal in life is not to have a happy home, but to have a husband to go to heaven. God looks at the motive. I don't know if you know that. And so I can do things for the wrong motive, and it doesn't go to my account. I can do things so I'm seen of man, like the Pharisees. That doesn't count. But when I give, it has to be sincerely from my heart to the Lord. And so when I say I trust God, well, does this sound like I'm trusting in God? Oh, just want to tell you I really love God, and, you know, my shoes are kind of tired, and they, I, I wear size 9. <laughs> Is that trusting God? No. That's letting your knees be known. Trusting God means I don't have to hint. I don't have to do anything. It's what Elijah did, I think, is one of the coolest things in the Bible. He stood before the altar. He poured water over it. He poured water over it. He poured water over it. Why? Because there's a tendency. We have a big, la a big lighter. We're going to light and help God out. I'm going to call down fire, but let me just get this part going. And God wanted to make sure that it was so drenched with water that even a spark wouldn't start it. It had to be a supernatural work from God. That's important. Because if it's not supernatural, it won't really make a difference. It's not going to change your life. Because if I start it, and listen very carefully, if I start something, I have to finish it. I have to maintain it. And that is really a bear. It'd be better for God to start it. That means that God's going to maintain it. And God's going to put it together. So it's like the, the image we see in the Bible that all of a sudden Z Zerubbabel and Zechariah, they saw this, you know, uh, two trees, oil trees coming into the oil lamp. And the trees were bringing the oil trees or the, these trees were bringing oil into the lamp. And you didn't have to fill the lamp all the time. 
So he goes on to say, it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. I don't have to wake up in the morning, don't have to wake up at night and make sure those things are filled because the oil is coming from the tree. It's a supernatural work. So that which God has started, because God gave us the marriage, because God ordained this thing, God's going to hold it together. And that's how I should live. That means I trust God. That means I don't have to have something from God. I just trust the providence of God. I trust God for who he is. He says he's good. I believe that. He says he's going to feed me. I believe that. He says he's going to be light between darkness. I believe that. And that's the thing that God wants you to have. And the reason why is because in verse 2 and 3, trouble is going to be in our life. It says in verse 2, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. So you're going to have people gossip. They make ready their arrows. You're going to have people threatening your life. They're going to have malice against you upon the strings that they may privately or actually, it says, in dark, shoot. And that's kind of really a, a, a cheap shot. It means that you're not expecting it and you get hit in the chest with a shaft of a piece of wood. It's an arrow that comes flying over this rock. You have no idea where it came. And it hits you. And you didn't know it. You didn't see it. They fired it from behind and you got nailed. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. They should face you. They should talk to you. They shouldn't go around your back. And so we get hurt. We don't do Matthew 18. And this is what happens oftentimes. We just see devastation because people get hurt. And this is exactly what happens. We get shot down. I didn't have a chance to do it. And we see that what takes years to build, one person can tear down. It says for the arrows. He was shooting arrows, but they were in dark. If the fa- and this is where we are today. This is where we are. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I don't know. If the foundations of our country, if we leave the Constitution, if we begin to twist and turn things around, you know, what can we do? But here, if the foundations be destroyed, what are we going to do? Well, the Bible says when the righteous rule, the people will rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people mourn. And so what are we going to do, gang? The Lord is in his holy place. Remember, tonight, God is setting. He's laughing at the nations. They are dropping a bucket. The Lord is on the throne in heaven. When Uzziah died, what did Isaiah said? I looked up and I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. And his train did fill the heavens. In other words, sometimes God has to take people away that we see God. Sometimes for 51 years, this king ruled in Judah. But God had to take him away so people could see. And when all of a sudden this great king is gone, David, uh, I mean, I should say um, uh, Isaiah went crazy. He says, what are we going to do? And then he looked and God opened his eyes and he saw that behind the throne was God. Behind the rubbish was the Lord. Behind all this stuff is God. There's always a God behind everything that goes on in our life. And then verse 5, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hates. And God hates that. And then we find not only does he sets in heaven, does he sees, but finally in verse 6, God sends pestilence. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, brimstone, and a horrible tempest, and shall be the portion of his cup. We know that when Russia attacks Israel, 5-6 of Russia is going to perish, according to Ezekiel 38. In other words, God is going to bring hailstones down and destroy 5-6 of the army, annihilate the Russian army. 1-6 will then join the northern kingdom, which is uh, China. Uh, East, I should say. And so here, upon the wicked, he shall rain fire, brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of his cup. And then lastly, in verse 7, such a cool thing, he's going to live by faith. For the righteous, Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance does behold the upright. Now, it's not saying the righteous is bummed out. The righteous is mad. The righteous can't pray for those in authority. It's not saying that at all. And in fact, if you really look at this, all it's saying is David said, I am going to trust in God. Then everything else kicks in. You see, if I would just say that, God, I want to trust you this time. Oh, Stephen, can I remind you that I sit in heaven? And can I remind you that I see everything everyone does? And can I remind you that I'm going to send fire down and consume all those who have touched you? Some people have said that the tears that God catches is actually the things that God is going to throw down. He's going to throw your tears down, and that will be the brimstone coming upon the unrighteous. That's pretty good. I like that. 
But again, God catches the tears. So if that is true, which it is, then do you think that God's going to let anyone touch you, the apple of his eye? No. So you are in a great place. You walk in the light. As he's in the light, you have fellowship with him. So tonight, you don't have to know everything. And you don't, know how, you don't have to have the end of the story. But you have to know this, that God, I can trust him. And God, if the foundations are messed up, we are in trouble. Amen.